Museum and Archives here in, in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And we're very happy to have all of you here. And our guest this evening is Brianna Simone Jones. Brianna, say hello. Hi. We're really happy to have you here. Um, uh, it's great to, to talk about your your uh, new book. And so it's uh, it's great to have you here. And thank you very much for, for being here. Uh, well, for those of you who don't know about Stonewall, uh, we've been here uh, since 1940, uh, I'm sorry, 1973. We've been around for 47 years here in South Florida. And uh, we have one of the largest LGBTQ libraries in the world, 28,000 volumes in our library and 2,700 linear feet in our archives, over 6 million pages of LGBTQ history. And so if you are here in South Florida, please stop by. We're located at the ArtServe building in Fort Lauderdale, 1300 uh, East Sunrise. And if you wanna learn more about us, you can go to stonewall-museum.org and you can find out everything about our archive and our library and our exhibitions there. We have two exhibitions that are up, this uh, up right now. One is called uh, Off Our Backs, Early Lesbian Publications from 1956 to 2000. And in addition, we have an exhibition called The Saint, which was a famed discotheque in New York in 1981. And so we're very happy um, to have both of those exhibitions. And they're also uh, online, you can find uh, curated talks as well as uh, virtual exhibitions as well too. So again, that's all at stonewall-museum.org. Uh, the Saint will be coming down in about two weeks and then we'll be doing a, no, a new show called um, uh, Don't Ask, Do Tell, which is about the United States government's um, and the military's relationship with the LGBTQ community. And we actually will be having a, a reception with the um, for the general public and those announcements will be happening. So we're very happy to begin to start doing some uh, post-COVID uh, programming. This series that you're participating in now, these are all being re recorded and uh, we started them a year ago uh, when COVID really started hitting hard. And I think this might be episode 37 or 38. If you have friends who cannot uh, attend this evening, um, uh, they can uh, see a videotape of this, which will be posted on our website. Give us about 48 hours and it will be up on our website. You can see all the past uh, episodes there as well too. I'd like to do a shout out to my colleague, Ema. You there behind the scenes? Hello. Hello, Ema, nice to see you. Happy to have you, you here. And Ema, uh, have you set this up for uh, for f Facebook? Are we, are we broadcasting live? Yes, yes, we are Great. broadcasting live. Great, so hello to all of our friends on f Facebook. M many p people now, um, that they, they watch these uh, series on Facebook as well too. And so I kind of think those are all the notes that I have. Um, so uh, Brianna, uh, welcome. It's nice to, to meet you. You and I have not met in person, but happy to have you as part of the series. Where are we finding you this evening? Uh, so I am currently in Atlanta. I'm, I'm sorry, what? Currently in Atlanta. Atlanta, Georgia, yeah. Mm -hmm. What? Uh, let me turn my fan off here. So what brings you to Atlanta? I have family here. Um, nice. so I needed to visit um, my ceremony for graduation. Uh, it's taking place next week. And so I needed to come here to sort out a few things. Great. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, uh, it's nice to have you here. And uh, how have you been dealing with COVID? How's this, uh, how's this last year been for you? Uh, I think that this last year uh, for me and, and many Black folks has been really difficult. Um, as you are aware, we're not just dealing with COVID as much as COVID has transpired alongside um, anti-Black violence. And so I would say that, you know, those things have um, worked together to create really difficult circumstances. Mm -hmm. um, and so I feel thankful to have had access to uh, vaccinations, but um, I am at much uh, dis-ease with uh, the recent murder of Micaiah Bryant um, and a, a, a number of other folks. So yeah. COVID has, um, you know, happened alongside that type of violence. So, right. And of course, the, um, the violence for Black people in this country has been going on for uh, probably since its beginning. 
it's been something which has been really part of our culture. It's, it's nice to see that uh, finally, maybe there's a little flicker that there's some people who are understanding about what white supremacy is. And, uh, and it's, it's a tough process, I think, for many people to go through. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it's certainly a reckoning in many, many ways. Um, right. do, you have, do you have any foot forecast about that reckoning? Uh, no, <laughs> not it. Not it. I'm, I'm young. And I think that um, in reading um, old texts, um, even, you know, a text like Black Lesbian in White America, um, it, it appears that we are experiencing the same <laughs> sort of unrest that Anita Cornwell spoke about over 20 years ago. Yeah. More than 20 years ago, so I have no insights, <laughs> no, no remedies. Yeah, uh, do you have any hopes or any despairs? Um, yeah, I think that you know, in a lot of ways, um, my desire, of course, an immediate desire, is for you know, black life to not just matter, but to be actually treated as precious life, mm -hmm. um, as valuable life. I think that. The slogan, you know, a couple of years ago um, was definitely, or folks were suspect about it. And so it's been really interesting to see how it's um, been commodified. And, and now we're stating, you know, Black Lives Matter. And so I'm hoping that there will be actual conditions that are created for um, Black and Indigenous folks uh, to actually survive um, and be well. So mm. that's my my one desire. Yeah, yeah. It's, um... You know, time, you know, time will certainly tell. Uh, you're absolutely right from a historical standpoint. We've seen these, these bursts and these bubbles in the past. Uh, and we've seen um, times that have happened that seemed like real change uh, with regard to sexism or racism or homophobia would, uh, would actually happen and then it seems like everybody gets all excited about things and there's a lot of conversation and then somehow the 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 pressure kind of just flattens out and then everybody goes back to their old ways and um and and you know i you know i i you somebody has to have the wisdom of solomon of <laughs> to sort of figure out how to how to untie this this Gordian knot that society for the last four or 5,000 years has, has, um, has put itself into. And it's, uh, it's, it's, it's an interesting intellectual and sociological issue in the sense that how do you undo all of these years? I refuse to believe that we've actually changed the species. I, I, I believe this is all learned social behavior. Mm -hmm. I don't believe I don't believe that we have ruined the species with the racism and the and the sexism and the privilege that certain people. I I do believe in the power of the species itself. We we, we all know from a science standpoint that certain things can happen to, to to different species and they can actually affect it. But I remain remain optimistic to say that we haven't r ruined the species, but that how to break those societal uh, norms and those things that we have, uh, you know, for, for for me before this last um, this last uh, uprising happened over the last four years or th three years for me it was always railing against the Catholic Church and the influence that the Catholic Church as an institution had on society mm -hmm. and how it sort of how it did so many things it's not that I'm, I'm anti-Catholic it was just more about the idea that it had so much impact on society um, and I think I think it's possible to undo that and also I think it's it's possible to undo the racism and the sexism uh, and and the white supremacy that we see. I just don't know the answer. I, and I don't know anybody who, who does know the answer. Um, I know, so I guess we have to wait. <laughs> <laughs> so where did you go to undergraduate school? So um, I attended two different institutions. I was a college uh, basketball player. So uh, yeah. I went to George Mason University um, and I graduated <clears throat> from Kennesaw State, which is about 25 minutes north of Atlanta. Sure. Yep. I've actually been to the Kennesaw State 
uh, campus and I brought a show there called Arts Aids America uh, about the impact. I don't know if you saw that exhibition, probably about five or seven years ago. Uh, and uh, it received some political pushback uh, about having an LGBTQ uh, exhibition there, and uh, there were some pretty powerful pieces in that, but I do know the university, and it's a very well-respected university as well, too. And then you went on to graduate school. Where'd you go to graduate school? Um, so I got my MA from Georgia Southern, and I uh, just defended my dissertation and passed um, at Michigan State University. Yeah, so. congratulations. I, yeah, no, I saw, saw that. I mean, and just so people know, um, Brianna is, uh, is a doctoral candidate, but in, in the Department of English at M Michigan State. But am I correct to say that you've now finished that program? Yes, I'm finished. Yeah, congratulations, yeah. Um, and I will be uh, moving uh, to the University of Connecticut in the fall. Yeah, so, so will you be t teaching there? Yes. Congratulations, that's great. Thank you. So tell us what your thesis was on. Um, so, my thesis really covered the life and work of Audre Lorde, um, and I think my dissertation um, expanded my understanding of Lorde's work. I think Mouths of Rain sort of contributed to um, my more expanded understanding of Lorde's work. Um, and so I've moved into thinking of the, the Combahee River Collective um, and the proliferation of texts that were published after that particular formation. Mm -hmm. um, in the 1970s. And so I'm tracking that particular history um, and really naming it a particular literary uh, movement, um, which it has not been named before. So, so uh, is it, is, are you at a point where you can share your th thesis on Order Lord? Um, I mean, I, I can, I don't, I would have to have to find it, but yeah, no, no, I don't mean we have to do it right now, but I would love to be able to put that in the archives with regard to, we have a pretty substantial of file and it would be nice to actually have that in the archives. And so if you can send that to us, send us a PDF of it, that would be great. We'd be happy to share that with the people as well too. I do think that uh, fresh re research on uh, subjects, uh, particularly for, for me, I think particularly to 20th century to topics and su subjects is really nice. And I think looking at them in this lens uh, and you were able to defend your, your th thesis on this and get your PhD on it uh, mm -hmm. certainly does put, um, does put a uh, seal of good housekeeping as they might say. So what are you gonna be teaching in, in Connecticut? So um, I'll be jointly appointed in the Department of English and Women, Gender, and Sexuality Studies. Yep. So yep. in English, what, what are you going to be? I take but both of those are uh, undergraduate uh, uh, departments. Um, so the they there are uh, graduate students, um, both programs and departments, um, and so there will be a mixture between undergraduate you know students as well as graduate courses. So tell us a little bit about uh, your classes and uh, what you anticipate uh, about the English side and then also about the gender and queer studies side. So um, the English department is um, really invested in having, you know, a person of color teach their um, AFAM lit surveys. And so um, I will be teaching um, that particular course. I am teaching first though in the women, gender and sexuality studies uh, class and so or program. And um, I'll teach, I think it's a course on lesbian, gay, um, bisexual and transgender literature. And right. so um, because I have recently defended my dissertation, I have not thought about the syllabi um, and so, <laughs> yeah. or syllabus. And so, um, but I will say, I think, you know, some text or some folks that I'm excited to teach um, would be Christos and Coley Driscoll. Um, I'm excited to teach, you know, Pat Parker again sure. um, and introduce folks to Caribbean writers like Michelle Cliff, um, as well as, you know, reading the text, Zami, among other things. I'm hoping because we'll be in the Northeast that we'll get a chance to visit the Schomburg um, or the Lesbian Her Story Archive. Yeah. 
And if you haven't been to Lesbian Herstory Archives, it's a wonderful uh, uh, repository of lesbian feminist culture, you know, really going back to the early 1970s. And I've worked with them uh, many times over the years, and I think they do an amazing job. One thing for folks too, if you're interested in any of this stuff, and also Brianna, you may want to use it as well too. Uh, the Stonewall National Museum and Archives, as I said, has over 28,000 volumes in our, in our library. It is one of the largest, if not the largest LGBTQ library in the world. Um, and you can actually um, access our card catalog by uh, going through our website. And I'll tell you, it's a, it's a little bit varied, but if, if you allow me to just give you a little bit of direction here, if you go to stonewall-museum.org and then you go to programs and you go to library, you'll see some general stuff. And then a little red type there, it says uh, search our catalog. So you can actually go directly uh, into our catalog there and you can uh, put in, any name or topic uh, that you would like, and you can see all the books that are in that particular library. Mm -hmm. What it does is it doesn't tell you particularly a, an academically curated group of books, but it tells you a very broad section of books that might be of interest around a particular topic. And so uh, for those of you who are interested in looking at other opportunities out there, Stonewall, of course, is a great way of being able to find that. So uh, let's talk a little bit about Audre Lorde and then we'll get to, to the book. And I know that you've got some readings prepared as well too, which I'm looking forward to, to that. But so can you remember when you first heard Audre Lorde's name? So um, ironically, um, my mother was taking a course um, when I was in grade school. And I remember um, Audre Lorde being one of her favorite writers. Interesting. I was age seven. However, at age 19, I was taking um, an American Lit Survey and we had not read um, any texts by uh, Black women writers um, in the course. And we were at the end of the term. And so our professors uh, stated that we could write our final, you know, we would have free range with who we, whose work we could engage. Um, and so I actually asked my mother, because at that point, I had not been introduced to um, Black women writers um, until my junior year and senior year of college. Um, but my mom actually had <clears throat> much of Audre Lorde's over um, at, at, at home. And so she mailed me a box of books, um, including Audre Lorde's work. Um, a first edition of Alice Walker's In Search of Our Mother's Garden, um, and an African-American lit um, anthology. I think it was edited by Henry Louis Gates. Um, here. And so uh, that was sort of my first introduction to her work. I mean, it actually wasn't in the academy. And so I feel fortunate in that particular way though. Well, but I mean, what a wonderful story and the idea that there you were in college and you realized it, you were going to a good school, but you realized uh, the deficit in the in the exposure that, that you had to right. the writers. Um, and then you were able to reach out to a very familiar part of your world, i.e. your mother. Mm -hmm. And she was able right. to box up, you know, just the idea of saying, I'm gonna send my daughter, I'm gonna send her this box of books, she needs this, you, you know, she. She's not getting it at her at her university. She needs this, mm -hmm. and she puts those books in a box. She puts those uh, those books in a box and sends them to, to you. As opposed, I, did she put any brownies or anything sweet or anything fun or you know anything but motherly, or is it just books in the box? Oh no! Of course, there was a card. Uh, my mom <laughs> very sentimental. Um, she would have dropped them off if she could have. Yeah. Yeah. Is your uh, and 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 but so but so then that changed your perception to black women writers at that point, right? Yeah, um, yeah my perception was um, completely transformed, and I think that the the power of of Audre Lorde's work I think was really made legible in that moment. Um, and I'm, of course, reflecting back because at 19, I was still coming to an understanding of myself, my brain, you know, was still developing at age 19. And so 
I didn't really understand um, the significance of the moment. But even in looking back, you know, um, my mother was grieving at the time that she was introduced to Audre Lorde's work. And so A Litany for Survival um, is, a, is a poem that she returns to. And I think that for a woman who identifies as, you know, Baptist, heterosexual, um, and, and is also a woman, I think it's very interesting um, that those differences didn't create a chasm, you know, between her and Lorde. Instead, um, she felt very, it was, it was a relatable, she was a relatable author. Yeah. Um, and had a relatable experience. Um, and is your mom still with us? Yes. So yeah. Well, give her a big hug for, for me and tell her as, as being a, a mom, she did a great job by turning you on to Arthur Lord. She probably knows that, but uh, uh, kudos to, to her for do, doing that. Um, sure. Yeah, no, it's really amazing. Um, so let's talk a, a little bit about Mouths of Rain. Uh, and for those of you who don't have it, uh, you should, uh, we, we certainly have it in the library at Stonewall, but you should go out and get a copy from your local independent bookstore, or if you have to do it online, that's that's fine as well too, but uh, certainly support your bookstore. Um, so this is the 2001 publication. And so how long has this, has this um, work been in the works? Um, so the opportunity is separate from actually the actually work being in the works and so I think that um, you know from my first introduction at age 19 um, to the moment that I was applying to MA programs um, in 2012 in 2013 I think from that moment I had been uh, teaching particular texts and so the Norton anthology is an English department favorite. And so while I didn't understand at the moment um, the power of pedagogy or the power of anthologies, I did recognize sort of the, the linear narrative or the, the single story that was being, in my opinion, highlighted or replicated in the Norton. And so while I couldn't you know, develop the language or did not have the language um, in my earlier graduate study, what I did realize is that you know, if I was the instructor of record, um, if I had some leeway in terms of what I could assign, perhaps, you know, these particular gaps could be filled in by my supplemental readings. Um, and so I began with, you know, teaching various texts by Baldwin and Audre Lorde very early on, but then sort of expanded my reach um, and taught, you know, the work of Terry Jewell, read Jordan Arabato, et cetera. And so prior to, um, any awareness or any desire to um, construct an anthology, it had, be, it had been a pedagogical praxis for me. Um, but it had also been, you know, a portal through which I found my own self. And so, you know, while I was teaching these particular texts, I was also reading um, text and... You froze a little bit. Yeah, you did too. <laughs> Yeah, so you were saying as you were as you were t teaching those texts and reading those texts also what right i was still um literature to me was a, a portal that i that i discovered my blackness my lesbianism um my queer ways of living etc and so while you know the, the the pedagogy was extremely important i think that in real tangible ways i was i was looking to these particular writers um or thinking of them as guideposts yeah. Uh, and so the anthology sort of emerged um, really, I think, in a serendipitous way, in the way that Beverly Gosheftal describes Words of Fire. Um, and so I don't know if you have a follow up question, but I don't want to go off on a tangent. No, it, no, you're doing good. You're doing good. But uh, but of course, uh, this the new press is an imprint of Norton, of W.W. W. Norton, right? Um, that's what you, you were saying? No, no, no. That's not what I was saying. No, I was saying that. I was in my teaching, so in my graduate study, um, I was, I, I had been assigned the Norton text as, or Norton anthologies, various editions as required readings or as required texts for the courses that I was teaching. Got it, okay. That, um, so, and I'm just checking now, and indeed the new press is not, is not an imprint of Norton. So, sorry, so that was my, my, my mistake. Okay. Um, so how old were you when this project uh, came about when it was presented to you? Did it feel daunting at that point in your life? Um, not necessarily, not daunting. I think that in the summer of 
2018, um, I had a conversation with Beverly Gaishefdaw, um, Spelman College professor, um, as well as the founder of the Women's Research and Resource Center. Um, and that summer, I was conducting archival research between Emory um, as well as Spelman College. You know, I was looking at Alice Walker's papers at Emory, and I was looking at Audrey's work at um, at Spelman. And so we had met, and I planned to interview her about my dissertation. And so something that I explained to her and something that we agreed upon is that the genealogy of black lesbian thought has yet to be concretized, you know, across genre and across form. Um, and what a shame that actually was that particular type of, of epistemic oppression. And so Beverly, Beverly mentioned that she always wanted to uh, create a companion to Words of Fire, but never had the time. Um, and so she suggested that, you know, I reach out to the new press and explain to them that, you know, this is this project that I would really like to take on. Um, and actually it, it'd be sold or understood as a companion uh, to Words of Fire. Um, and so I emailed the press and they got back to me, I think with, within two, two, to, two to three days, um, very quickly, um, quicker than most departments, you know, regarding students and faculty. Um, and Julie Enzer, who I've been really thankful for um, her, her breadth of knowledge regarding um, not just black lesbian thought, but lesbian thought in general. Um, that was the person I corresponded with. Um, and between the, you know. Let me interrupt for a second, but Julie Enzer's here. So hello, J Julie, let's say hi to her. So she's hi, here Julie. with us. <laughs> Julie, I won't be nervous. Um, but uh, I lost my train of thought. Um, well, you were just going through the yeah. process, yeah. Summer, yeah, the summer of 2018, um, which was really late July, I think, or maybe early August, I reached out to the press. They responded very quickly. Um, and then by October, I submitted the book proposal alongside my dissertation chapters. Um, and I signed the contract in February of 2019. Wow. And so I was you know, constructing the anthology alongside completing my dissertation. Um, but just to be clear, I what, what I think really helped bring the project to fru fruition is that I was teaching the text mm. or I was either reading, you know, particular text um, for my comprehensive exams. Um, I had, you know, an exam list that was dedicated specifically to black lesbian writers. Um, and so I think with the turnaround time, it, it happened in that way because of the work that I was doing, um, not realizing that all of this experience or all of these PDFs will be archived in one particular text. Yeah, so that's an amazing story as to how that un unfolded. And, and it's a wonderful way of understanding how books do happen. And I guess, you know, if you can separate yourself, you know, and, you know, move up to 10,000 feet, you know, now you have this book and, but you also know you have all of the academic work that you've done as well. But this is now out there in consumer land. You know, this is on the shelves of Barnes and at Noble, which is different. I mean, it does represent academic work, certainly, but it turns itself into a piece of almost uh, contemporary culture, where it's something that people it's something that people can get, whether they understand it, they can go there and they can pay, you know, eighteen ninety five or or twenty five dollars, whatever it is, and and they can buy it. Right. How does it feel having your academic work? sort of um, move into this thing where it becomes part of popular culture? Um, thank you for that question. I think that um, my, my academic work, I think is sort of ancillary to my commitment to like black folks or black community. Mm -hmm. And so I think that I was very happy to take on the project alongside my dissertation because I wanted to have an opportunity to, to sort of speak to an audience. Um, I think the academic audience is extremely small. Yeah. Um, and I think now folks are recognizing that we actually have to engage the general public. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that what I'm, I'm happy about the book is that it'll actually be in, in communities um, and actually be a resource um, and guidepost for, for other black lesbians or other queer folks. We don't necessarily or me, you know, folks have emailed me or, um, you know, sent messages in other formats 
you know, saying that they don't have a particular kind of community where they live. Um, and I recognize that books cannot stand in for actual, you know, human contact. But I do think that books can inform, you know, who we are or who we become or what we can aspire towards. And so I think um, I'm extremely happy to have a foot outside of the academic institution. Yeah, I mean, that's what I would think too. I, I would think like, man, it's like so amazing to have your academic work and everything that's there, but then have it beautifully pre presented and have it out there in that way. And then also the point that you just touched on there a little bit, which of course with anthologies like this, we don't know what the reaction to this will be 10 years from now. We don't know how much this will be a home. Well, this will be a, well, this will be a collection of, of things that will actually uh, sort of form and shape thought and will be the go-to source. Um, and uh, I think that's really very interesting as well too. It's sort of, it's really like you just, you you come from, from the academic and the research side and then it moves into commerce. And then you know there's the possibility that it could have an impact on um, intellectual capacity going forward and, or actually changing lives going forward by what people read here and, 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 and how they think and study and de develop. And I, you know, I find that to be a, a fascinating phenomenon and also for you to participate in that way. Um, right. I mean, you've got great people in this book and it's incredibly well researched. Um, so let's dig into the book a little bit. And if you don't mind, there was one thing that I thought was really sort of amazing is that there are a number of introductions and, um, and prefaces. There's a foreword, um, and then there's an introduction, which you wrote, which I think my experience is that you are incredibly modest in the fact that your introduction is only five pages long. Mm -hmm. as the editor you you were you were profoundly mo modest in that mm -hmm. and I found that to be really refreshing there are many times that I read introductions by editors um, uh, of anthologies that unfortunately to, to me it seems like it's too much about them mm -hmm. and and um, and maybe this is part because you're at the beginning part of your career of doing all, all this stuff but you, but you were very precise with your words and you were very careful with, with what it seems to, to me with what you said and what you laid out. You as a voice mm -hmm. didn't want to be stronger than so many other strong voices in this, right. in this work. What, what, am I right there? Right, and I, and I think that, um, I think you are right, yes. Um, and it, it had less to do um, with being a junior scholar and more to do um, to me, with, with the work itself, I think that the work sort of speaks for itself. Yeah. Um, and I was just really honored to do it. And I think that there is a fungibility to Black lesbian thought that can't sort of be defined in these very prescriptive ways, right? We have, I think Red Jordan or Arabato is sort of a major or primary example of, of the evolution of one's um, queerness. And so I really didn't, didn't think that you know, what was at stake was telling people what it meant to be a black lesbian, as much as I wanted to sort of make legible or bring to bear uh, the work that has already been done. Um, and so I think it was really important for someone like Cheryl to open up the book. A few folks asked me, you know, why didn't I, um, you know, have myself first? Um, and to me, I think it was important for Cheryl, someone who wished that they had this text as they were sort of you know, growing up or, or moving, moving through their own lesbianism and through their own sort of academic career. Um, and I, I think that, that generosity is something that um, is a politic, you know, even outside of the academy. Um, and I think, yeah, the work, the work really does, <clears throat> in, in my opinion, speak for itself. And so I wanted to give people, um, you know, a few guideposts or ways to understand the text you know, recognizing that the epigraphs um, should provide some context, um, but largely in part, uh, the book is an experience, I mm. think. Yeah. And, um, I didn't want to impose on my reader because I knew that <clears throat> my audience would extend beyond the place that I work. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and it's, you know, that context is so important. And with all that being said, though, you didn't pull any punches about who you were. And so you, you tell me as the reader who you are 
Mm -hmm. And if I can, I'd love to read, I would like to, to read the first paragraph of your introduction. Absolutely. Thank you. This collection is an offering. In it, I aspire to trace the long history of love between Black women because I have come to recognize that our love stories have been buried underneath our activism. But our love, too, is both personal and political. Mouths of Rain aspires to tell a deep and ancient history of eroticism from the purview of the poet, blueswoman, essayist, and critic. Mouths of Rain aspires to demonstrate how life can be made anew if we dare to survive. Black lesbians have fully embodied new ways of being, teaching us how to expand our own expectations of the possible. Love and living are sacred to Black lesbians. Their words outline a hope and a future. If you need a reason to survive or a litany, Mouth of Rain, Mouths of Rain is a communion, mantra, and daily bread. In that paragraph, you say a bazillion ideas. Mm -hmm. And you put yourself out there in so many in so many different ways. How does that feel? Yeah, I think that um, it feels feels good, but also scary. You know, um, to sort of walk. I bet, in, I bet it does. Walk, bet it does. walk in, in in who one is, but I think that in in coming out of this sort of proverbial closet, I, I think that um i i grew tired of not being able to articulate who i was i got you know i grew tired of being afraid and so i really do you know audrey lord it's it's sort of i guess um ironic or even contradictory that like you know your silences really don't protect you and so there's sort of this 50 50 chance if i say something things could go well if i don't say anything you know things could not go well etc and so it's almost like the, the athlete phrase, you miss, you know, 100% of the shots you don't take. Um, <laughs> and this was really, you know, taking, taking a shot at, you know, who I am as a person, who I am as a writer and the particular um, imperatives that I have. And so um, in a lot of ways, um, I was thinking of, of COVID, you know, as I was editing and rewriting the introduction um, and really thinking of isolation, right? What type of text would people in isolation actually need? What type of text would be useful? Um, because I think that, you know, I would like the work to, to have sort of a tangible um, or material use. Like I, I don't, it, it's not sort of publishing a book for tenure or publishing a book uh, to receive a particular kinds of compensation as much as it is, you know, wanting to unveil a particular history or, or pay homage to um, particular writers who I think have largely been marginalized um, for reasons that, you know, we could name, but ultimately is unjust. Yeah. And yeah, so, right. yeah. Because I the reason, model that, you know, in my own yeah. writing. The reasons, of course, as we touched on early in the, in the conversation, of course, are things like racism and sexism and classism and, and uh, homophobia and all those things that have existed, not just today, but have existed for thousands of years. And so that's, that's why some of those voices. Will, I know you have prepared a few things to read. Thank you for allowing me to read that part of your- oh, Thank you, yeah, thank you for reading it. I'm, I'm happy that you, that you liked it. You know, it's always, it's always um, very strange for folks to read your writing. So. Yeah, yeah, no, no, and it's and it's a little bit of a it's a little bit of a thing to 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 do that. But you know, for you to hear someone else read your work, you know, um, uh, ho hopefully I did it justice. But it's, definitely, uh, definitely did. Yeah. So, who do you have lined up to, to read from the uh, from the, the book? So I actually um, prepared uh, a slideshow and one that oh, um, I was great. able to, to share before, but that I thought would be really interesting um, to just sort of explain how even part one of the anthology was constructed. Sure. And so I'll share my screen and I'll, I'll read a little bit. What I, I'm gonna play a clip from The Color Purple. Um, what I do think is that Facebook and 
Hollywood or whatever, they will X out of the video. And so for folks who, who want to know what the video is, if you go on YouTube and you Google, um, you know, Seely and Suge's kiss, you will be able to sort of see exactly what I'm showing. Um, but unfortunately, the government is watching at all times. <laughs> um, but hold on, I'll share my screen in a minute. All right, so uh, really quickly, I think that it is important for folks to know uh, that Mouths of Rain, an anthology of Black lesbian thought, um, is the companion anthology uh, to Words of Fire, an anthology of African-American feminist thought um, the New Press published in 95. Um, and so, you know, really quickly, I think that, you know, it's important to mention um, <clears throat> that my academic introduction to Black feminism, which has shaped this project, which has shaped um, how I've defined myself as a scholar and in, in some ways a Black woman, um, is, is sort of really important. And so my, my introduction to Black feminism was through the work of the Combahee River Collective. Um, and as I mentioned, Beverly Guy Sheftaw, and so her anthologies that not only included Words of Fire, but also Gender Talk. Um, and so Hortense Spillers, is another Black feminist whose work um, I respect and think is extremely important. Um, in 2019, in the winter of 2019, Spillers made, I think, these really uh, poignant remarks um, about Black feminism or the particular ethics um, and, and, and praxis of Black, <laughs> of black feminism. Um, and I'll read the slide, but Spiller states that I should like to think that Black feminisms as a repertoire of concepts, practices, and alignments, it's progressive in outlook and dedicated to the view that sustainable life systems must be available uh, to everyone. It also stands up for the survival of this planet, which pits itself against the kleptocratic darkness that now engulfs us. If we're going to reach a different place, and it is difficult these days to be hopeful, I would acknowledge then Black feminist ideas and ideals might be one of the lights leading us there. And so I think that um, I echo or share Spiller's opinion, you know, that Black feminist thought or Black lesbian thought is one particular trajectory or one particular roadmap um, or one particular light <clears throat> that might lead us to this particular liberatory space that many of us um, are dreaming up. And so I just wanted to, to be very clear that, you know, Mouths of Rain is part of a particular genealogy. Um, Mouths of Rain is also um, could be understood as a, as a Black feminist text in some ways. Um, and so I just wanted to really uh, highlight that. So um, in studying the genealogy of Black lesbian, of the Black lesbian radical tradition, uh, through folks like Angelina Weld Grimke, uh, Cheryl Clark, Dion Brand, Audre Lorde, Pat Parker, Kathy Cohen, and Alexis Pauline Gums, I was attempting to locate um, particular patterns in their respective epochs or genealogies. And so the five parts of Mouths of Rain um, attempts to archive, you know, these historical, spatial, and embodied discourses. I think by studying them, we might be able to learn um, from their from their languages. And so I really do believe Audre Lorde when she said that there are no new ideas, there are only new ways um, of making them felt. And so as I mentioned before, Mouths of Rain is building upon the work of Tony K. Bambara's publication of The Black Woman in 1970, as well as Words of Fire, but also two central texts that I think really underscored Black lesbian history was Afrikiti, um, edited by Catherine McKinley and uh, Joyce Delaney, as well as Does Your Mama Know, um, which was edited by Lisa C. Moore. Um, and Lisa has copies of Rep of um, Does Your Mama Know available. And so I really um, encourage folks to buy that text. Um, but really, really quickly, part one, um, uses of the erotic. I think that Lord's poetics of the erotic um, how she insists that the erotic is praxis or something to be exercised. I felt that 
you know, that essay, um, as well as her philosophy needed to be archived again. And so, you know, in Lord's discussion of the erotic, you know, to me, it means that celebrating the erotic really means to mark one's pleasure. Um, and in the essay uses of the erotic, you know, Audre Lorde encourages that uh, our work becomes a longed, a, a conscious decision, a longed for bed, which we enter gratefully and from which we rise up empowered. And so when I was, you know, constructing this section, I was really thinking of in what ways have um, Black lesbians work been a conscious decision? Um, and so I think that um, as you all can read on the screen, this particular section, you know, begins in 1909, sort of giving um, or paying homage to Angelina Well Grimke's work in the publication of A Mona Lisa um, to uh, 2020. And so um, really quickly, these are images of Angelina, Alice, and Audrey um, from my left to right. I don't know if you all can see me. Um, but I think that the color purple was a text that was read, you know, by my classes or, or, or in my classes and by my particular um, professors, but I was really happy um, to not just read the color purple, but I was very excited when I was also introduced to womanism, but that was much later um, in my graduate study. I had not been introduced um, to the full breadth and depth of Alice's work um, until much later. And so, in 1982, uh, this particular text, The Color Purple, was published. Um, and in 1985, um, the film by Steven, or Steven Spielberg adapted the book into a film. And I just want to show um, a particular clip between Seely um, and Suge, because I think that their relationship has always been um, particularly striking to me. Um, and I always hoped that the discourses about their shared intimacy could be further explored. Um, and so I'll show the clip and then I'll show you an image from the archive of Alice's work that I actually included in the anthology. Thank you so much for showing that clip because I think that what's so interesting about it, I haven't seen it in quite some time, but there, but now in this context, of course, there is such a degree of normalcy about seeing the relationship between those two characters, but yet we know it's, it's as you mentioned, um, it, it has, it has um, met nothing other than unnormalcy by uh, others in the press and the government and other places. But to see it in and of, in and of itself like that is so be beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. No worries, thank you. Um, and so I think that, 
you know, my first introduction to uh, the color purple and then my introduction to uh, In Search of Our Mother's Garden was really clarifying for me. And so really quickly, uh, this is just a screenshot from um, the opening pages of In Search of Our Mother's Garden where Alice Walker is um, defining womanism. And so in the second description of womanism, um, Alice mentions that a womanist is also a woman who loves other women sexually um, and or non-sexually. Um, and so I think that I was really fortunate in 2018, you know, when I was conducting my archival research to actually have um, found this particular poem by Alice Walker, um, which was unpublished and titled, Can It Be? And so Alice published this particular poem in 1993. And I think it makes legible once again, you know, her capacity to not only love, um, but to portray love or describe love as something expansive and unrestrained by colonial constructs of gender and sexuality. Um, I think in a lot of ways, Alice's queerness or her mapping of a, of a queerness in, in this particular relationship between Suge and Seeley is oftentimes excised. Even womanism um, is not necessarily always understood um, as sort of a queer understanding of what it means to exist as a Black woman. Um, and so I think that, you know, can it be being written 10 years later um, after the, the publication of the novel or almost 10 years after the publication of the novel um, was really exciting. And I think my impetus in publishing it is that I was hoping uh, to map a constellation um, between Alice's own uh, queer experiences and what she described uh, in the relationship between Celia and Shug. And so um, I've only included the first page. Um, and so I will read um, the entire poem in a moment as I get to it. All right, and so um, there was there were actually two different versions um, of the poem, and um, I chose the version that I chose. I think um, it was really just a, a word difference. And in, in one of the poems, uh, in one version, she's describing the the person she's talking about as a lover, and then in the second version, um, she describes the 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 lover as a woman. Um, and so I was, I was happy to even, even track her editing process. And so if you have Mouth of Rain in the audience, um, or if you will be purchasing it, uh, Can It Be is found on page four. Uh, Can It Be by Alice Walker. Can it be that I am dying after all, even though I am happy and you say you love me? Can it be that I am weeping after all, though your arms reach to hold me? and my mouth is imprinted with your kiss. All day long, I languish about my house, eating and sleeping, washing travel and misunderstandings from my locks. Every thought is a view of your vivid dark eyes and how they pin me to my soul, of your gentle mouth and how its nearness to mine brings breath leaping to my throat of your wilderness of hair, now lost territory to my exploring fingertips. Oh woman, your body is as sacred to me as the earth, the black of it so secret, so sweet and so mysterious, the brown of it so velvet and so lush. My eyes and hands and tongue are weak with wanting you. Washing dishes, sweeping a room, writing a letter, they call to you. Give us our proper work, they cry, the work of devotion. My mind curls around your bed while you sleep angels about your forehead when you rise at last and back into your dogs. There is no exhaustion like that of passion. I feel as though my heart has nearly expired on our mutual rack of bliss. And so beloved, I suffer 
creating or constructing mountains of reasons to separate from you out of molehills of memory, a crossword, a cross look. But I know in my heart that it is only love and I have loved beyond capacity. And now fatigue has laid me low and caused me to think of dying and caused me to weep. I wonder if like here, the rain is falling gently where you are. If the bright green spring is everywhere and everywhere seems to be on fire. If the stiff wind as you walk the dogs blow the freshness of new beginnings into your soul. If you are making music, if you are happy, if you miss me as I, you. Wonderful. We only have a few minutes left and folks, if you have any questions now, now's the time to throw them into the, um, into the chat or the question part. Uh, and we will certainly get to those as well too. I do have one question I wanna ask you based upon something that you said, it's a little bit um, far afield, but did you have a career in high school as an athlete, as a-, as a Yes, no, yeah, I played basketball. Mm -hmm. You were a basketball player. I was actually not planning uh, to go to the academy. I was planning to be a WNBA player. So it's, yeah. quite, it's quite ironic. Um, that I accepted a position at UConn um, because their women's basketball team is like a, a school that all sort of Northeastern or New Yorker uh, kids wanted to wanted to play at or, or school that folks wanted to go to. So those are two very different paths, you know. Um, tell us how that transition happened. Um, so I think that uh, injury <laughs> really facilitated the transition. So I've had several or suffered several uh, knee injuries or surgeries through playing, but alongside you know basketball or sports, I was all, always a student who enjoyed reading, um, writing, who enjoyed going to school. And so um, those are my two twin, I guess, desires. Um, but I do think that as I matured and as age set in, um, it became clear to me uh, that I would have to pursue a job that would not require so much physical activity. So, so being a Black lesbian uh, in both of those fields, in sports and now in academia, which one is easier and which one is more difficult? Which one is more accepting? Which one... Uh, I, you're clearly not done with that journey yet, but but you've you've had a, you've had a foot in two different worlds, right. and uh, and so who you are is very much a part of what you present. Which world has been easier? So neither. Um, I would say that sort of the precarity has existed in both spaces. Yeah. Um, I will say that um, I felt like as an athlete, I was surrounded um, by folks who lived in my community. Yeah. And so I would say that I, I was ultimately more connected to that space yeah. uh, or more connected in that space. I think that in the academy, um, while folks might think that, you know, it's a liberal space, I really don't think that it is, especially if your queerness is something that's legible uh, through style of dress or through speech um, or through other sort of even other aesthetic things. And so um, neither world was easy, but I could say that I have felt more like myself as an athlete. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I think uh, I can, I mean, not having been, um, certainly never having been in the athletic world, and, and I certainly have been in the academic world, but I can see how that would be my first guess as well, too, that there would be some more camaraderie there. I can only wish for you in your career as an, as an academic um, that you find more camaraderie in that in that world. And also as an academic, I hope you find ways to be in your athletic world as well too, because the academy can be as boring as shit, so. <laughs> it's, it's a job. And I think keeping that in perspective is, is really yeah. important. Well, our time is up. And so I have thoroughly enjoyed uh, our conversation. I thank you for all your frankness and all of your contributions. It's been a great, great talk. Uh, this, of course, will be, uh, people will be watching this later on Facebook. Uh, we're there now, but hello to all of our friends on F Facebook, and it will be posted to our w website uh, 
probably probably ne next week. Um, and anyway, this is the the book. Um, Miles of Rain. I hope everybody goes out and get, gets a copy of it. And Brianna, uh, good luck to you at U UConn. I hope it's a great transition for you. And um, uh, and just keep on doing the good work that, that you're doing. Thank you. It was very nice to meet you. Thank you uh, for sharing space with me. And, yeah. and, and also, FYI, whenever you have an opportunity to come to South Florida, you know, our archive is, and you have spent times in archives, as I can see, see now, but, you know, we have 2,700 linear feet, 6 million pages. Uh, we're pretty strong in the American Southeast um, and, and certainly in Florida. And so um, anytime you want to come down and research something or spend some time and sort of kick around a few boxes and see what you can find, uh, please feel free to re reach out to me. Yes, absolutely. I will be seeing you soon. And thank you for the invitation. You're, you're welcome. Good night, everybody. Uh, have a safe week. And uh, we'll see you all next week. Thank you. Bye.